Hi, everybody. Welcome to Episode 3 of the Midnight Kingdom Lecture Series. I'm Jared Yates Sexton. I appreciate you tuning in. I also appreciate all of the kindness and support from the previous two episodes. Uh, I'm enjoying this, having, having these conversations uh, that are adapted from my upcoming book, The Midnight Kingdom, A History of Power, Paranoia, and the Coming Crisis. Uh, it comes out on January 17th, 2023. And if you haven't already, go ahead and pre-order that book. Uh, that helps me. That helps my work. Uh, it, it's always appreciated, particularly in, in the lead up to the, the release of the book. So if you haven't already, uh, go and pre-order The Midnight Kingdom, A History of Power, Paranoia, and the Coming Crisis uh, from your local bookstore or any of the other retailers that you, uh, you like to use. Uh, so here we are. If you haven't already, go back and watch Episodes 1 and 2. Episode 1 began, of course, with the fall of Rome and the merging of Christianity with state power, which has created uh, a lot of the things that uh, we're unfortunately still dealing with in this world, including the conspiracy theories and mythologies that the wealthy and the powerful have used to protect themselves and to become more wealthy and more powerful. Episode two took us through the capitalist apocalypse of World War I. And now here we are in episode three, where we're going to talk about the rise of fascism, Nazism, and also how the modern order of this world was created. Uh, A reminder, as we're talking about this history, what we're actually talking about is our modern moment. And as I've been warning about for the past few years, we are in the middle of a crisis. And that crisis is going to determine uh, both the fate of democracy, but also the future. Uh, A lot of the things that we're going to discuss today are going to be mirrors of things that we're currently dealing with. They'll help explain how we've arrived at this moment, but also Give us a warning about exactly what's happening and where things are going. Um, You know, recently we've been watching the rise of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, which have always been components of these movements, these anti-liberal, anti-democratic authoritarian movements. Uh, But also the state of the world as we're beginning this lecture, as we're starting to look uh, at the 20s and the 30s and the 40s, In a lot of ways, it looks a lot like what we're dealing with now. There are some changes. There are some things here that vary. But we can learn from these cycles. And we have to learn from these cycles. We have to understand both what we are facing, but also what opportunities are out there. Because while we're facing this danger, we're also looking at the possibility that we can make a better world. I personally am very optimistic that we're going to take advantage of that opportunity, that there's a window opening that could make for a better world, a fairer world, a more human world. But in order to seize that opportunity, we're going to have to recognize it. We're going to have to look at the past and we're going to have to look at the things that we have gone through and the things that we should have learned from at this point. But unfortunately, the wealthy and the powerful, they oftentimes control information, which we'll talk about a little bit today. But we need, to, we need to learn this. We need to actually sort propaganda and mythologies from truth and reality. So that's what we're going to do today. And we're going to start with the Great Depression. So like a lot of you probably, um, I had grandparents who grew up in the Great Depression. And what I was always told about was the, the personal suffering on the ground. Um, you know, both of my grandparents were extraordinarily poor. Their parents uh, were moving from one job to another. Uh, my grandmother often told stories about being evicted out of their house multiple times in a day only for their neighbors to help them back in or to, to help them out with some sort of uh, kind charity or solidarity. But, you know, the, the larger thing that happened uh, in, in all of this is something that um, we don't learn from, or at least we don't learn from permanently. Uh, you know, the, the Great Depression is a very traceable thing in terms of how it happened and, and what it was that, that melted down uh, the economy, not just in the United States, but started uh, an international crisis that would eventually lead to World War II. But more or less what we need to focus on in this particular lecture and in this conversation is the idea of laissez-faire capitalism. And following World War I, particularly in America, there was the idea that 
America should sort of take care of its own, that it should take care of its own economy, that we should just hand over power and control over to the wealthy and corporations and businesses and create a consumerist society. And as that took place, um, we, we started having a lot of these psychological appeals that we talked about in the last lecture that were handled by people like Edward Bernays, the nephew of Sigmund Freud, who were able to use psychological appeals to um, appeal to our insecurities uh, and, and our fears about ourselves. And as a result, it, it led to us buying things that we didn't necessarily need. And in a lot of cases, People started spending more money than they had on these luxuries and these goods, and they went into more and more debt. And as this system grew, this bubble grew and grew and grew, and eventually, because of laissez-faire capitalism and also uh, all, all of this rampant greed, what ended up happening was a natural imbalance that, that happens in capitalism when, when it isn't restricted. And we had talked a little bit earlier about Adam Smith, the author of Wealth of Nations, who is, you know, seen often as sort of the father of capitalism. And, you know, a lot of people, particularly libertarians and capitalists, will tell you that Adam Smith was all about the invisible hand of the market. And, and you don't want to do anything with the market. It will regulate itself. But what you actually learn if you look at Adam Smith is even he said that if you don't regulate capitalism, Things are going to fall apart. And, he, and, and, and all the people who have studied capitalism, they, they've noticed that eventually there's a certain point where there's an imbalance of capital, where there's concentra too concentrated capital on one end and eventually the entire system falls apart. Capitalism has been a cycle of booms and busts. And it just so happens that when there's a bust, normal everyday people suffer the consequences. And in this case, that's what happened. So when the market goes down in the United States of America, you have uh, the, this period where people aren't able to get jobs. They're not able to get the money to uh, afford the things that they need. Uh, you know, you always talk about depressions. This giant malaise takes place. People are, are, are suffering. Their, their lives are shortened. Many of them commit suicide and their lives fall apart. Um, it's a really awful awful situation that was only exacerbated by the leadership that was in place. Uh, the, the proponents of, of laissez-faire capitalism, they didn't have any other solutions. What they were being told left and right is, oh, this is natural. This is how capitalism works out. You should go ahead and let the market decide winners and losers. Let it liquidate everything, right? It'll be fantastic. So while the powers that be allowed people to suffer, um, they just sort of sat back and expected the system to correct itself. But what ends up happening is a figure named Franklin D. Roosevelt emerges. And Roosevelt is a, a, a very wealthy individual. He comes from the elite capitalist class. Uh, but one of the things that Roosevelt realizes is that capitalism is sick. And the only means of saving it is to go ahead and change it. And in this way, Roosevelt was actually taking care of capitalism as opposed to trying to destroy it. Uh, one of the amazing things about Roosevelt, and there are, there are reasons to criticize Roosevelt and there are other reasons to lionize him, but one of the reasons that we, he, he deserves credit is this is a person who stood up and essentially betrayed his class. He decided to go ahead and in order to save capitalism, he needed to go ahead and move power and wealth away from the wealth class that he belonged to. Um, <clears throat> as Roosevelt does this, and, and I want to I take a shot very quickly at conventional history. Uh, you know, when the record books are written, a lot of what we're told is Roosevelt came along and said, let's try this new deal and that's what happened. But that's not at all what happened. When Roosevelt starts advocating for uh, correcting the problems of the inherent contradictions of capitalism, he's called, I know this is shocking, a socialist, a communist. Uh, he's referred to as, as the first communist tyrant president of the United States of America. Uh, it's very reminiscent of what people say about, you know, liberals and Democrats now. It's, it's, it's almost verbatim the same stuff. On top of that, there are all these conspiracy theories about Franklin D. Roosevelt. 
You know, it, it's it's not like he's just welcomed in. Like you even hear from a very Trumpian figures, the powers that be, that that Roosevelt is betraying the country and it's socialist and he's going to destroy America. Um, it's the exact same echoes of what we're still still dealing with to this day. Roosevelt also has another problem, and 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 actually a myriad problems if if we're going to be honest, because this system is set up to interfere with anyone who's going to ever try and disrupt this concentration of capital, because the way the United States was founded was explicitly to help those people and to continue uh, any sort of accumulation of power and wealth that they could they can have. So the system, first of all, stands against Roosevelt, and Roosevelt has to use the bully pulpit. He has to basically go out to the people and say, I need power, I need your support if we're going to make this thing happen. Look at these people who are trying to keep me from helping you in order to carry out the New Deal. And the New Deal is about using the apparatus of government to regulate capitalism, but also to go ahead and inject money into the rest of the country. So basically, you would have the government taking public funds and putting it into public works. That includes, you know, having the Civilian Conservation Corps, having unemployed young men go around the country creating parks and infrastructure, uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority. This is about updating the infrastructure of the country, plus also giving unemployed, hurting people something to do. In a way, Roosevelt is actually going ahead and cutting off the growth of fascism and authoritarianism. Because one of the things that we find is that young men, particularly young white men, if they don't have anything to do and their fortunes are down, turns out they'll go looking for authoritarian solutions. And in the United States of America, prior to the New Deal coming in and sort of curbing that fever a little bit, there's a whole lot of authoritarian growth. You have one fascist group after another, including Nazis, who are gaining power and purchase within the United States. Now, not only does Roosevelt have to go up against the system, he has to go up against the wealth class, you know, essentially his own people. We start to see even fellow Democrats go after Roosevelt. We see fellow Democrats attack him, trying to undermine his agenda. And what do they do? They start, this wealth class and this corporate class, they start coming together to pool the resources to go after Roosevelt, to undermine his agenda, to undermine the New Deal, all of this economic thinking that he's bringing uh, in, in, into the office. They start aligning and, and they start going after him politically, but also they start talking about the possibility of a coup. They start talking about the possibility that maybe Roosevelt needs to be shoved aside because he's obviously a closeted socialist and he's going to destroy America. This is something called the business plot, which you know used to be the thing of rumors but has been proven by history to be correct. So the, these wealthy industrialists and corporatists and capitalists – they want to save their skin. They want to take care of themselves. Roosevelt is a major, major uh, problem for them. So who do they start turning to? They start turning to fascists. They start turning to people who would be willing to overthrow the presidency of the United States of America. They start turning to people like the Ku Klux Klan and even grosser iterations of the Ku Klux Klan who are going after labor unions, who are going after leftists. They start absolutely forwarding more and more money towards anti-democratic projects and anti-democratic energies. Now, eventually, this will be curbed because World War II begins. But we can't sit here and look past the fascistic energies that were taking place and taking hold in the United States of America and were gaining the support of the wealth class. For a while there, even a, a now disgraced American hero, Charles Lindbergh, was part of the America First movement, which was trying to push America into aligning with Adolf Hitler, the Nazis, and the fascists. This was a particularly powerful movement with those authoritarian, authoritarian impulses and also gained the backing of a lot of wealthy, influential Americans. It's almost unthinkable what would have happened in the United States if Roosevelt had not embraced this new economic thinking in terms of how the government was supposed to work, but also what would have happened if World War II wouldn't have commenced the way that it did? 
uh, the, the fascist energies in this country were off the charts. And one of the things that we see around the world at this time, in all of these places that we now pretend like fascism, like never held power, right, in, in, in the U.K., in France, in all of these supposed like uh, uh, pure democracies, right, we see that fascism gained power in purchase, just as it did in the United States of America. It's almost unthinkable what might have happened. But Franklin D. Roosevelt's ideas on how to save capitalism from itself probably saved America from an authoritarian fascistic movement taking power in totality. Now, in Europe, and particularly in Germany and Italy, we see cultures that weren't as lucky as the United States when it came to these authoritarian energies and impulses. Uh, the Great Depression allowed the, these uh, growing movements to take power. Uh, in a lot of ways, they were sort of disdained. They, they, they were sort of on the outskirts and, you know, polite society looked down on them. But whenever this economic crisis hits, all of a sudden people become very desperate for answers. And when, like, traditional leaders don't have answers, authoritarians come up out of the woodwork and promise solutions. Uh, they're brutal solutions. They're, they're, they're awful solutions. But they offer those solutions and they offer the conspiracy theories that explain what has happened in order to appeal to the, the ugliest parts and prejudices that are inherent in white supremacist Western civilization. So one of the things that we, we see here with the, these authoritarians and the Nazis and the fascists, we start to see a lot of the industrialists who created the industrial age, who, who, who made the modern world, the ones who were given public funds in order to create modern societies. Those people, because of their concentration of wealth, um, they, they naturally abhor democratic ideas. And, and we're seeing this right now currently in our modern times. Wealthy people do not want democracy because that is seeding away their power. They want something more elitist. They want something that allows them to control the levers, whether or not that's directly or indirectly. That is just the nature of, of wealth and power. So these industrialists, they're living in these countries, Germany, Italy, you name it, where you start to see the rise of other answers, right? You start to see a lot of socialists. You start to see a lot of communists. You start to see a lot of leftists who are starting to offer other solutions. Uh, and that is the destruction of capitalism and or the restriction of capitalism. And the industrialists and the wealthy, all they see is a threat. They see the possibility that if these people are allowed to have power, then that might mean that they might lose property or they might lose power themselves. So they start betting on the authoritarians. You know, they look at someone like an Adolf Hitler. They look at someone like a Benito Mussolini and they say, you know, I, they're a little brutish. And yeah, I don't really care for the way they handle their business necessarily. But, you know, I do like that they're in the streets doing battle with leftists and socialists and communists. It's a better bet for them. They make the bet that through their money and through their influence, they'll be able to control these authoritarians. They'll be able to basically use them as attack dogs on chains, right? So in order to protect their wealth, the capitalist wealth class starts giving resources to the authoritarians, to the, to the future dictators, and they go ahead and basically buy them off as a protection source, uh, you know, o o almost like using them as their own personal uh, bodyguards and police and influencers. And as they do that, these groups grow in power. Because these, these problems aren't being taken care of. The capitalist wealth class cannot solve the problems of the Great Depression. They can only exacerbate them. And as these authoritarians are taking advantage of the frustration, they're starting to gain power that doesn't necessarily even rely on the wealth and the influence that they're being given by these industrialists. They're speaking to larger concerns, right? Because liberal leaders... These, these democracies, these representative governments, they're not fixing the issue because they've been bought off by the wealth class. They aren't going to actually create any of the solutions like that FDR was carrying out in the United States. In these countries, liberal democracy is literally failing by the day. 
And we had mentioned in the previous lecture this idea of the trenchocracy, right? That these veterans of World War I, they came home and they started looking around. They said, liberal democracy sucks. It, it doesn't get anything done. It's corruptive. And on top of that, it makes us weak. It makes us vulnerable. And what do they do? They tell the people a story. And it's the same story that the powerful have been telling uh, for, for centuries at this point. The white supremacist mythology of the conspiracy theory. And the way it works, again, is this. The nation is good. It has been chosen for bigger, higher things. We are protectors of Western civilization. We are protectors of all that is good about civilization. But guess what? There are people outside of the country. And again, Jewish, puppet masters, Masonic conspiracies, the Illuminati, you name it. Liberal uh, cabals, you name it. Those people are outside the country conspiring against us, like a Satan, like a devil, right? Because we are the rightful people. We have all the right in the world to determine the trajectory of the future. And they're conspiring with the leftist on the inside of the country. And they are forming a, a, a conspiracy triangle. And they're also using uh, vulnerable populations in order to carry out what, what they're doing. As a result... Well, liberal democracy has to be destroyed. Liberal democracy is seen as an impediment to what needs to be done. It has made us weak, right? On top of that, they're replacing us. They're getting rid of white people, Aryans. They're getting rid of the rightful rulers of the world. There is a conspiracy to do this. And by the way, if you're saying they're saying this sounds a lot like white replacement theory, it is exactly white replacement theory. And on top of that, by the way, They've taken control of our culture. They're using our culture against us. They're, uh, they're, they're using their influence, their evil influence to undermine patriotism and undermine rightful patriarchy and white supremacy. It's the exact same thing that the right and the conservatives are telling you to this day, that there is a conspiracy in, in, in popular culture and in media circles and in information and in education. And in order to answer this threat, we need to destroy liberal democracy, we need to take over all of these modes of influence, and we need to hurt the people who are doing it. If that sounds familiar, it should. It is exactly the situation that is playing out again. And because we are in another crisis of liberal democracy, because our leaders have been bought off by the wealthy and the powerful and have been corrupted, because that has happened, we are facing another crisis of confidence. And that the illusions that hold society together and hold orders together, they're flickering. They're starting to fall apart. And guess what? Authoritarian answers are back in fashion because they are essentially the only people who are offering solutions because the left has been destroyed. So in this moment, back before World War II, the appeal is, is very, very clear. We need to destroy liberal democracy because it, it, it's a weakness. And, and by the way, they gender it. They make it, you know, feminine. They, they, they say that this is the means by which strength is destroyed, right? And we have to renew society through fight and through uh, clashes and, 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 and through battle, right? So we need to destroy liberal democracy. We need to take over education. We need to make sure that culture is reined in because it's being used against us, right? We're being manipulated by our own culture. Women need to be put in their place. People of color and Jewish people need to be stamped down and either destroyed or enslaved or just basically totally and utterly oppressed and exploited. And a total control of the society is the only means by which the crisis can be answered. We are in another moment that looks exactly like that one. And I have to tell you something. The wealth class helped them out because they wanted to protect their property. But it wasn't just them, right? It wasn't just the hypnotic speeches of Adolf Hitler that won people over. The white middle class was won over. Because the white middle class, in terms of class structure, has a choice, which is, are they going to align with the working class or are they going to go with the wealth class and protect what privilege and power that they have? What was seen prior to World War II is that they made their decision and they made it with resounding clarity. They threw in their lot largely with the authoritarians and with white supremacist fascism and Nazism. 
That is the ugly truth that people don't want to sit with. They want to pretend that Hitler had occult powers, right? Or that there was some sort of a mass hypnosis that happened through the cultures. No, they took advantage of white male insecurity and middle class fear. And as they did that, society started working around these people. At first, they were brutish and ugly thugs and they didn't want anything to do with it. But eventually, it's like, I mean, I don't know, they make the trains run on time. And if you want, go ahead and pause this video and go back and look at how, you know, liberal institutions like the New York Times and the Washington Post, how they treated Adolf Hitler, how they treated Benito Mussolini. They welcomed them in the same way that people like Winston Churchill welcomed them because they saw them as a necessary alternative to communist and socialist and leftist. They were greeted as executives. You know, maybe liberal democracy is overrated. Maybe we need a strong hand in order to make these societies work. And what was revealed was that capitalism always, always, always is going to side with authoritarians and dictators and fascists and Nazis over the alternative, which could possibly challenge the order of capitalism. So a quick aside when it comes to fascism and Nazism, we have to talk about how it is that they were uh, capable of creating these movements, what it was that made them different, but also notable, particularly uh, in the face of what we're dealing with right now. We're going to talk more about Christian nationalism, QAnonism, Trumpism, MAGAism, all of that, uh, probably in episode five of this five-part series. But I want to take a moment and I want to talk about that authoritarian impulse that takes place prior to World War II, which we're still dealing with to this day. In order to change things, in order to grasp that window of, of, of epoch changing moments, right, where you can move from one order to the next, one of the things that has to happen is you have to replace the old mythologies and the old ideas with new stories and, and, and new sort of mythologies that replace them. There are tons of ways to do this. Uh, and, and basically any world-changing movement does this, right? Uh, sometimes it's about trying to replace capitalism with communism. The USSR created a cult of person personality around Vladimir Lenin and then Joseph Stalin, right? And a lot of these ideas of shared struggle and, 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 and you know, what, what communism was trying to offer as an alternative. In this case, Nazism and fascism used the Christian idea and tried to build off of that as a foundation. It was the idea that the world had become too secular, okay? Like, like, it had allowed too many things to grow. It was the idea that time needed to be rewound backwards. And we had talked in episode one about the difference between liberalism and conservatism. Liberalism, of course, reacted to the religious controlled world, the, the, the monopoly that Christianity had over Western civilization by instituting laws that would protect people and also start to bring cultures together. That way you could have a mixing of, of people and hopefully in the future some sort of a, uh, a peaceful state where we could all sort of live in, in, in peace and harmony. And the ability to do that, the liberals believed, was basing the world on laws that got rid of hereditary power in favor of like laws, right? Just like the, the idea of protection of property, uh, inherent freedoms that, that people had to adhere by, but also, again, uh, a preference towards property. Conservatives wanted to reinstall the rightful hierarchy is what they believed, that there were natural hierarchies in the world, the great chain of being that I talked about in episode one. They always wanted to destroy liberal democracy in order to reinstitute those controls. Fascism and Nazism attempted to roll that back. They were confrontations with capital L liberalism. And what they used, particularly with fascism, it was the Catholic Church. And with Nazism, it was more Lutheranism and the Protestant religion. They tried to co-opt those religions to go ahead and create, again, an environment of rightful persecution. We have God on our side. We have the will of the universe on our side. As a result, we can do whatever we want. That's rightful persecution, right? That's positive persecution. If you do something to us, it's wrong. You are part of a conspiracy and, and, and you must be destroyed. Uh, on top of that, 
they started trying to create new mythologies. Uh, a lot of this had a basis in old esoteric ideas, right? And, and it's everything from like uh, the lost continent of Atlantis to uh, past uh, evolutions of species and, 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 and these, these myths of blood and these myths of, of, of white supremacy, but also of like magic powers and Nordic giants. And I mean, just off the wall stuff. But it was an attempt to create a new religious environment to control the mindset of the people. They saw liberalism and liberal society, uh, uh, cosmopolitanism, pluralism, you name it. They saw it as being decadent and decayed. They looked around and they said, look, look at these gay people who, who are living openly. Look at these women who are allowed to have rights and, and, and walk around and, and pursue their own lives and fortunes. Look at people of color who are, are not being just absolutely ground down into dust. This needs controlled. And that idea of positive persecution was again revived. That rightful persecution that when you have God and the universe on your side, it doesn't matter what you do to them. Now, this was not only used in a cultural sense, in a political sense, it was also used in an economic sense. Because one of the problems that had happened with the meltdown of the economy with the Great Depression was that it was exposed that things weren't fair. There wasn't actually a working meritocracy. There was a system that exploited people. And eventually people reached a point where they're like, why am I working this hard? Why am I settling for something less? That's why leftism started to grow in power and influence. The Nazis, the fascists, the right, they needed to have some type of an answer that would go ahead and make the capitalistic system work. Authoritarianism, that, that, that strong hand, was needed in order to put the system right again if it was going to continue on, along a similar lines, or at least that was their theory. That meant that they needed to break labor unions. They needed to break solidarity. They needed to fight leftism in, as a counterbalance to capitalistic exploitation. Their theories of esoteric religion, their ideas of these myths that they were trying to create, including the worship of people like Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini and the accompanying myths that were necessary to make them powerful, that was going to be used as a sanctifying of the labor. You have to go into the factory and do the work because otherwise the Aryan mission will fall apart. Western civilization will fall apart. It is a struggle. And if we allow that struggle to be lost, we're losing a religious battle. They saw their attack on Jews. They saw their attack on women. They saw their attack on gays. They saw all of it as a religious war. That was the ideology that legitimized what they thought that they needed to do. In that regard, it became a crusade, not just the wars of going into other countries and taking their territory. It legitimized what they thought that they needed to do, including the mass murder of Jews, Roma people, gay people, uh, uh, people that they saw as unworthy of life. That was the story that they told themselves, that there was another higher purpose behind it besides just accruing wealth and power. This was also something that took hold almost everywhere. In France, the same thing happened. The far right welcomed the Nazis because they saw it as part of a higher calling and also as part of reinstituting past natural hierarchies. This is why like a lot of the proto-fascism was found in France along with the anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. And whenever it happened, they completely capitulated and worked right alongside the Nazis. There were many people within France who were happy to have lost the war and be invaded and be put under occupation. What ended up happening was this religion that the Nazis and the fascists created, this cult of personality and all of these mythologies, it was weaponized. That's exactly what's happening again now. You're seeing that with Christian nationalism. You're seeing that with QAnonism. You're seeing that with Trumpism. They believe that they are fighting a larger religious war, a religious crusade. And as a result, it legitimizes anything that they need to do, including destroying liberal democracy, but also carrying out mass violence. And you see this when you actually pay attention to what the right wing is talking about now. They're not just talking about disenfranchising. They're not just talking about going after woke corporations, which is absolute nonsense. They're not just talking about taking over 
culture uh, and, and, and by that, like making people, uh, you know, stop talking uh, about gay people or trans people. And, and on top of that, like going after pornography now, which is very, very strange, but also telling. They're also talking about needing to hold trials. They're talking about needing to hang people. They're talking about needing to lock people up. And the way that that happens, it's the ideology of that religious idea. It goes back again. Episode one, we talked about rightful persecution, holy persecution, righteous persecution. The story that they told themselves, that they created for fascists, that they created for Nazis, was about reinstalling that natural hierarchy that they believe in, that conservatives believe in. And this is where conservatism goes. And it just so happens that this is where conservatism and capitalism come together in order to create these fascistic environments. We're in another position where we are seeing this start to coalesce. And all of the signs are there that it looks a lot like what we were dealing with um, uh, in that pre-war and war period. Thank God we defeated them. That's, that's, I mean, that has to be said. Like uh, the Nazis and the fascists, the ideas that they had for the world and this new world order that they were planning on creating, it, 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 it almost boggles the mind to imagine it coming to pass. Um, it, it was in many ways the, uh, the full logical, illogical extension of white supremacist capitalism, but just without any and utter regard for humanity or, or the suffering that it would be necessary to do. It would have created a uh, neo-colonial uh, state that would have had the full measure of technology and psychological appeals and weaponry on its side. Um, it would have been bad. And one of the things that we see with rising fascism uh, prior to World War II is that it probably would have found a lot of purchase in a lot of different places. And it, and, and it would have been really, really ugly and bad. So thank God we won that. But we also can't sit here and pretend like the allies were somehow or another like totally pure of heart. Because as the allies win World War II, uh, the U.S. and Great Britain they very quickly, even before the thing has come to a total end, they very quickly start to think that communism is the problem. And so as they're defeating fascism and Nazism, they decide, man, maybe we should start teaming up with fascists and Nazis because we're going to need to defeat the USSR. We're going to need to fight this new war. So the plans are drawn up. They start bringing in Nazis. They start bringing in fascists, people uh, for their weapons programs, for their intelligence programs, uh, everyone from Italy to Germany to Japan. I'm talking like people who carried out some of the most grotesque human experimentation and suffering and mass killing you could ever imagine. They were brought in as allies and not just for weapons programs. But in Europe, you even have stay-behind armies that are there in order to not necessarily do battle against communists, but to take out leftists everywhere that they can find them. Uh, things like Operation Gladio are being carried out with fascists, with Nazis. These people are immediately co-opted into the cause that the United States and Great Britain see as the larger, newer cause, which is the burgeoning Cold War. As this happens... Any leftists are attacked. Democratically elected leaders or democratically elected uh, legislatures are interfered with. Elections are interfered with. You actually start to see any of the uh, liberal democratic ideas start to fall by the wayside because you can't possibly allow communism to grow. It's the next big threat. So you start to see this sort of duplicity. You see on one hand a lot of championing of liberal democracy and this new great world that's going to be created. While there's a lot of shadow actions, it starts creating a split in reality. And as that happens, you start to see the Cold War take shape. And the Cold War obviously is an ideological war, but it's also a war over resources. It's a war between the United States and the Soviet Union over who will determine the future and what the new order created in the post-war era will look like. The United States very shrewdly uh, takes care of war-torn Europe. 
Of course, with the Marshall Plan, we, we start seeing tons of money flooded into those areas in order to shore them up and make sure that not only are they allowed with the United, allied with the United States and capitalistic, but that they're not tempted away by the Soviet Union and that leftist groups aren't going to be able to grow and gain power and purchase in those places. Meanwhile, you know, fascists who are in the employ of the former allies, their former enemies, they're going to go ahead and they're going to kill a ton of people and they're just going to go after any leftist group and any burgeoning uh, reform that they can possibly find. Also, while this is happening, the United States more or less takes over control of capitalism. It moves from London over to New York. And you start to see America become the center of the capitalist world, which was something that a, a lot of British even saw coming. Uh, it was very obvious to people that at some point or another, the United States would succeed Britain. It just sort of gets up and moves because that's how capitalism works. It's very much uh, um, a parasitic organism. It moves from its main host to the next host. So we start seeing America making the dollar the, the, the main unit. We start seeing like this international finance start to take shape. And it's all based on U.S. interest and, and, and U.S. power. And as this happens, the U.S. is continually battling uh, the Soviet Union and it remains on a permanent war footing. There is a push to not only continue funding all of these war programs and keeping our arsenal up to date, but also creating intelligence activities, again, reactionary controlling activities that are eventually going to be used to go into these other countries and try and control the world. Make sure that literally any possible uh, opponent, any possible rival, any possible situation that wouldn't necessarily follow the U.S.'s uh, intentions and, 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 and whims is going to be crushed before it ever takes over. You start seeing like tons of plots and counterplots and, and, and just awful things being carried out by the Central Intelligence Agency, which is being used as a tool to forward capitalism, to forward U.S. business interest. Uh, you also see in the United States the Federal Bureau of Investigations uh, just absolutely looking after labor unions, looking after potential leftists, potential opponents of capitalism. CIA does that as well. They experiment on, on the American population. They're carrying out all kinds of illegal, unconstitutional operations. And eventually something grows out of it that's beyond our control. We don't vote on these things, right? These things at times are even beyond the purview of the president of the United States of America. John F. Kennedy at some point like with the Bay of Pigs realizes, oh, my God, these intelligence agencies, they're kind of in business for themselves. The problem is that the United States gives up any notion whatsoever of a moral leadership, of a principled leadership, a benevolent hegemon, of course. <clears throat> and it just engages in total resource war with the Soviet Union. It becomes true that fascism, neo-fascism, authoritarianism, maybe it's pretty useful to the United States. The United States will retain the idea of liberal democracy and representative government. All the while, by the way, wealth interests are there basically running things. And meanwhile, around the world, in the places we need them, in the places where we depend on the resources, where we depend on allyship, we depend on stability, we're more than happy propping up dictators. We're more than happy using authoritarianism as a tool to further our own interest. And one of the places we need to look at to understand how this happened is in Chile and in 1973. So now we need to talk about Chile. And we need to talk about something really, really unfortunate. Uh, the United States, uh, and, and this is one of those instances, uh, this happens with Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger, uh, this is one of those moments where the interest of the intelligence community and the capitalist class and the presidency is aligned, which can lead to some really gnarly things. Um, in Chile, uh, you have the ascent of a guy named Salvador Allende, and who, a, a leftist, a socialist, uh, who was intending to change things in that country, to move it a little bit left and, and maybe help out some people here and there. Uh, the government, uh, uh, the United States government, which 
had carried out one coup after another uh, in places like Iran, uh, tried really, really hard to keep Allende from becoming uh, the president of Chile. Uh, but eventually the, the vote is there. The people have made their choice. Uh, they start using a lot of the tools of the trade, which are these international capitalist bodies that, you know, deny you the money that you need or they make things economically very, very uh, uncomfortable for you. And all the while, they start reaching out to people, uh, right-wing reactionaries within Chile uh, who maybe will be willing to carry out a coup. And eventually that's what, what happens. Uh, they find a general named Augusto Pinochet who is absolutely up to his eyeballs in conspiracy theories. It's always weird how this happens. It's, it's before the internet, before social media, these people are reading newsletters left and right and they are just absolutely swimming in conspiratorial text, right? Pinochet takes over the country, overthrows Allende, and creates a military dictatorship with the full approval and backing of the United States and its allies. And a thing happens. Because they're willing to accept that dictatorship, eventually they start looking to build off of that dictatorship. Pinochet welcomes in a group called the Chicago Boys. Um, these are uh, a group of Chilean economists who were educated in the United States in Chicago, the University of Chicago with Milton Friedman. And they start bringing in this idea that's going to be called neoliberalism. And their ideas are this. It is a revival of past unadulterated liberalism in which property is the only thing that really matters and everything springs forth from property and the liberty that property gives you, particularly economic liberty. They go in and they use Pinochet's military dictatorship in order to install, quote unquote, discipline. Uh, this means that you go after all leftists, you destroy all, uh, you know, trade unions and labor unions, basically any resistance to capitalism, and you install austerity, which means that you take out all money that you possibly can that's going to help people, any programs that are there to uh, make sure that life is at least livable for some people, and you just make it a free-for-all. And all of a sudden, Chile becomes a really, really wonderful country for the capitalist class. All of a sudden, the people are getting paid cents on the dollar. Uh, they have no room to argue. If they do, they'll be destroyed. They'll either be unemployed or they'll be roughed up or maybe even disappeared, you know, if they make too much noise. And as a result, we have what's called the Chilean miracle. And you start to realize, oh, capitalism is really, really okay with authoritarianism and neo-fascism. This idea of neoliberalism uh, found its birth in the pre-war period in which a lot of uh, liberals, a lot of these economists, were really concerned about the state of the world. They saw a lot of what they considered bad ideas. Uh, they were all mass politics. They thought democracy was terrible. How could you possibly trust politics to a bunch of people who don't understand things. I mean, my God, the economy is so complicated. How could just a normal person even remotely understand it? On top of that, communism was absolutely out because there was no economic freedom. And fascism and Nazism were problematic because they were going to interfere with capitalism to a certain extent and have these controls and power. The only solution neoliberals believed was, again, returning to past ideas of, of original liberalism with property as the main component. And a reminder that liberalism in the United States of America, where it starts sort of finding its, its, its grounding, was explicitly classist and stratified and created in order to carry out the whims of the wealthy, the white, and the powerful. In this way, neoliberals seek to restore, tell me if you've heard this one before, a natural hierarchy. It's a blending in certain ways of conservatism and also of liberalism. And as this starts to take place, they, they, they start pushing all these economic ideas. They start populating the economic world with these neoliberal thoughts. But before Chile, before they could really make this case, right, before there was like a, a laboratory to, to show the world the potentials of neoliberalism, it was a lot of theory, Right? Like it sounded good and maybe it came off well, but nobody knew if it was going to work. But with Pinochet in Chile, all of a sudden they, they, have, a, they have a case study. 
It, it is shown to the capitalist world. Oh, my God, this works. Look at Chile. Not only is, is this discipline fantastic, but now all of a sudden Chile fits into a world order in a very useful way. All of a sudden, you can have cheap labor. You can have its resources. Oh, my God, authoritarianism might be great. And you start to even see some of the people, uh, like uh, Friedrich Hayek, who start saying things like, I don't know, maybe dictatorships are actually more free than democracies sometimes. They have no problem with this. They're very, very excited by this. And you start to realize that the, the, the usage of power to protect capitalism and to protect entrenched wealth and entrenched power, that is absolutely essential if this system is not only going to get off the ground, but if it's going to remain a constant. If you are going to have this new order that is starting to take shape, then it's absolutely necessary that you have someone there, an authoritarian, who is willing to do the ugly work. But hopefully, they're not going to be higher up. It's not going to be a Hitler. It's not going to be a Mussolini. Maybe they're going to be in the thrall of more benevolent liberal democracies, right? Who, you know, they're still going to have votes and stuff, although a natural hierarchy exists in those places. And also the government has been co-opted in the interest of the wealthy. But at least there's the appearance of it. Pinochet and a lot of other like-minded capitalist authoritarian dictators work in league with the United States and countries like, uh, like England and they create the largest international terrorist network of all time. Uh, check it out. It's Operation Condor. Basically, what they do is they use cutting-edge technology to go around the world and assassinate any remaining leftists, destroy any leftist groups, also working with fascists, former Nazis and fascists. And they basically wipe out any shred of leftism in the world. And, 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 and anybody who could ever carry out some sort of a, a, an anti-capitalistic uh, crusade against them, they're killed. And it's everywhere. They'll get you wherever you are. It doesn't matter what country you're in. They even assassinated a Chilean dissident in Washington, D.C., on Embassy Row. Like, this was a massive, massive operation, and one of the reasons why there really is no left left in the world right now. They were crushed. Capitalism carried out a massive, violent wiping out of the left, and all of it was to carry out this procedure that was going to lay the foundation for neoliberalism. Now, a quick word on the United States of America around this time and, uh, you know, a little bit of the fallout that we're still dealing with. I'll get more in depth in this in the next episode, but I want to go ahead and I, I want to talk about the post-war era. Uh, of course, the Soviet Union is uh, the big bad. It's, it's the big rival out there that is constantly coming after us. And, and by the way, just so we're updated on this thing, it's the same conspiracy theory. The Soviet Union is out there. By the way, in certain circles, they're still talking about the Soviets being Jewish controlled. So it's the anti-Semitic conspiracy theory made new. But the Soviets are on the outside. They're coming after us. They're, they're, they're creating these massive international networks that are going to destroy the United States and, and everything that we hold dear. Also, by the way, they're working with people on the inside. Traitors, liberal leftist traitors. And there's a bunch of vulnerable communities, mainly people of color and women and liberals and gays. All of them are working together to destroy the country. Shocking, isn't it? It's the exact same conspiracy theory that power uses to protect itself constantly. It finds its expression in things like Bircherism, carried out by the John Birch Society, which was so far off the map in terms of paranoia that it believed that Dwight D. Eisenhower was a communist agent and that the United States had already been taken over by communists. Um, the, the right wing, the conservatives, the Republicans, they start coalescing around this. They, they look at the Birchers and they sort of shake their heads. They think that they're uncouth and embarrassing, but they'll use them. They're, they'll absolutely use those conspiracy theories the same way that Edmund Burke and other conservatives have always used those white supremacist conspiracy theories and nationalistic conspiracy theories. They start coalescing. And they start building a coalition, a naturally existing coalition, but the, the ideas are specifically narrowed down. And the entire purpose of this is to destroy the New Deal. 
Of course, the New Deal helped save America's economy and keep us from fascism. But almost immediately post-war, they start working to destroy it. By using the menace of the Soviet Union and the fear of communism, they go after elements within the government. Some of them, by the way, are communist or socialist, uh, leftist. Uh, They start going after those people. They start going after the women. They start going after gay people. They start going after anybody who is considered vulnerable to this conspiracy in order to slowly dismantle the New Deal consensus. The idea that the government should help people. The idea that the government should regulate capitalism. The idea that the government should fund programs that make lives better and longer and more decent. And as this is happening... There is, of course, a social revolution that is brewing. Civil rights, uh, the social revolutions of, of, of feminism, the free speech movement, the anti-war movement, the, the, the gay liberation ideas. Like those things start growing at a very particular time as they're growing around the world. By the 1960s and 1970s, the people have had enough of the Cold War already. Uh, This back and forth between two superpowers that crush people and take over countries and overturn democracy. They're sick of it. It's starting to grow. The system is pushing back, both in the Soviet Union and also in the United States and around the world. The systems of power are terrified of a democratic, small d, uh, populist movement to change everything. Now, we'll talk more in the next episode, but this is a failed revolution. And what ends up happening is that it absolutely scares the living hell out of the wealth class. They look around and they say, this isn't good. Information is not on our side. Science isn't on our side. Culture isn't on our side. The people are not on our side. Right now, capitalism is in real trouble. And again, the wealth class, the only thing that they care about is their wealth and their power. They start to coalesce. They start to come together. They start forming coalitions. You start seeing partnerships between the wealth class, libertarians, evangelicals, but also the conspiracy theorists in places like the Bircher Society. You start to see a massive coalition build of conservatives who are going to take on the elements of what they believe is the left, these growing elements of this democratic revolution that that was staved off. They believe that they have to take over society through different means. And what ends up happening is that that coalition comes together And through the idea of neoliberalism, changes the world forever. Because the new order that was made possible after World War II, that that, that new moment in which the world could change and things could start shifting, it's grasped by those people, by the people who have every intention whatsoever to roll back liberalism and roll back progress and the New Deal consensus, and a world that is at all uh, tuned to make our lives better, they're going to roll that back and try and destroy it forever. And that's where we're going to pick up on the next episode. I want to thank you again uh, for tuning into this. Uh, again, your feedback has meant the absolute world to me. Uh, it's the, the kindness and the support. I, I, I literally cannot thank you enough. If you haven't already, go ahead and pre-order The Midnight Kingdom, A History of Power, Paranoia, and the Coming Crisis. Again, pre-orders help when it comes to authors and their books. I am making this series of lectures in order to get this information out there, but I still need your support when it comes to the book. Uh, with these lectures, please Share these with your friends. Share them with your family. Uh, We're talking about stuff here that uh, most people don't want to touch, but it's actually true. It's actually information that needs to get out there and counteract a lot of these conspiracy theories and misinformation. Because what we are talking about right now with this history is the history of how we've arrived at this moment, but also what is happening right now. We can see these cycles throughout history, and unless we learn from them, unless we push back against them, we are damned to repeat them. So go ahead, get this information out, and again, please pre-order The Midnight Kingdom, A History of Power, Paranoia, and the Coming Crisis. I'll be back with episode four very soon.